All right, Noah. Well, first, I don't come across many Noahs because my boyfriend's name is Noah, as I mentioned to you. So yeah, yeah. it's great talking to another Noah. So yeah. thank you so much for your presence today. And I'm just excited to get deep into conversation. And um, I have, I'm very happy to bring on a man of faith because I haven't talked a lot about faith on my podcast. And uh -huh. I just want to welcome the space to speak freely. And I hope yeah. everybody will open their hearts to hear your powerful messaging today. Yeah, sure. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, so uh, for those that haven't got the privilege to get to know you, learn about you, I would love if you could first talk about a little bit of your background and how you get started in your passion with art, because I know that that is one of your big things that you do serve in the world, and um, you've quite you've developed <clears throat> such quite success from that. So if you could give it a little yeah. background. Yeah, so the business started um, at 16. My parents split up when I was nine um, at, a, at a young age. And uh, I went in kind of like this entrepreneurial mode, both very talented parents, dad, sign painter, letter, graphic designer, mom, interior designer, both working with awesome clientele and um, love just what they did of taking vision out of people's heads and making that a reality. And so when I was living in Southern California down here, um, we then moved out to the Bay Area for a little bit, but then I moved back down to the Bay Area around 13. So at 13 is when really things took off for me in the creative space. And we were living in Newport Beach, um, Corona Del Mar, and uh, I, was, I just started going door to door. Hey, do you need to get some artwork done? Do you, want, do you need a sign? Do you need some graphic design? And I really took it to the streets at a young age and um, just wanted to start making money at a young age and knew that I wanted to be in business for myself. Just kept going to high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to forewarn you. Like, I'm probably going to have to clear my throat multiple times. <laughs> I've, I've been on Zoom for like a month straight, and I've lost my voice. So, <clears throat> excuse me. It's a whole um, other stage that people are on. <laughs> yeah, totally. <clears throat> now, you know, it went from toilet paper, it went to uh, hand sanitizers. Now it'll be like, you know, throat lozenges. Um, <clears throat> pretty crazy. But no, so for me, it was at a, it was at a, a early age. I knew I wanted to be independent and be in business for myself. But I also <clears throat> just looked at, okay, people are working and doing a job, but I also wanted to be able to um, kind of call my own shots and have that freedom, especially when it came to time. So at 16, I put my business card in the yearbook and um, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget that. I just, the moment I had a car, like then I could go meet all my clients. So I was doing stuff for corporate clients, restaurants. You know, if you walked into a restaurant, it said Sunday brunch. I was the guy that made all those signs back wow. in the day and there was no desktop publishing, no computers, nothing was like mass production at that point. So it was still hand lettering promotions, flyers, business card, brand identity, and just helping businesses with their, with their marketing and with their promotion. So two things that I was learning was one was craft and the other one was the art of marketing and the art of people, relationships. And so at a very young age, um, you know, going to church and youth group and playing in a band and possibly doing, um, you know, football for a living, pro football for a living, and then doing this art thing, I was kind of at a crossroads and I felt a lot of tension at 16 to 18 because I'm like, man, I'm not going to get a full ride to go to college. I am getting letters to go play football, but this art thing's already paying me money. So I had to kind of figure out what that was going to look like. And I was already making money from art. And I'm like, I'm just going to push really hard on this, on this art thing and really just love people, learn about it, fail forward. I, there really wasn't a playbook for it. It wasn't like, you know, somebody just said, here's the playbook on how to go into business for yourself and become an entrepreneur and be a creative and learn the disciplines behind that. There wasn't anybody that had that. Hmm. So because of my parents splitting up, my dad being gone, God brought some pretty important mentors into my life that helped illuminate what integrity, what business, what all of that look like, the disciplines look like, and self-awareness, what all that looks like through a biblical world lens. And it really turned my world upside down in a good way. Mm, so amazing. So let's talk about this. What was <clears throat> like the big turning point? Because I, I, I don't know if um, you said at some point when your parents split up, then that's really when you deepened your faith, if I'm correct. Yeah. What was the turning point that made you pivot into living your purpose fully like in a faith-based faith, faith, yeah, like, life. Yeah, going, going all in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
at 28, you know, I had, um, soon as, as soon as I turned 17, 18, I moved out of the house. I moved in with my best friend who was the guitarist in the band and, and he was a great friend of mine and, and still is to this day. And after that, um, moved into a warehouse in Newport beach and said, I'm going to take all of my money and I'm going to put it in, into the company. So I'm just going to live in this warehouse. So showered at the gym, lived in this warehouse for 22 years. Wow. Like, yeah. It was like, I'm just going to keep investing in here. And so um, I look back now, I'm like, dang, I should have bought commercial real estate, but you don't realize that back in, back when you're that young. Yeah. However, um, at 28, I hit a midlife crisis and I know it sounds crazy, but I had already been doing it since I was 14. So I'm like, dude, I've already got 14 years behind me. I'm wow. kind of burned out. And at that time, that moment right there at 28, I was painting so many different things for so many different people. The cars for the fast and the furious, working with Levi's and working with Motorola, painting tattoos on pink for her music video, um, uh, uh, working with Nordstrom and doing promotions for Nordstrom's and like all of these, like what you would think is the highlight reel of the best, greatest companies and opportunities in the world. And they were, they're incredible. And I was su super thankful, but I was completely empty. Like, the best way to describe it was I found out that I got to the top of the ladder of success and I realized it was leaning up against the wrong building. Mm. And I was like, dude, if this is it and I'm 28 and feeling this disenchanted and this like burnout and I finally got to the top of the ladder of success, money in the bank, working with great clients and, and all that, I just went like, dude, this sucks. And I just felt paralyzed in a way of like, if I'm 28 and I've got the rest of my life ahead of me and I've climbed this summit and I've reached this mountaintop, what's next? And I don't even know if there's anything next. I'm literally, I was in tears sitting on top of a, a cliff at this beach where I grew up in Corona Del Mar. And I was just, it was late night. I'm sitting there listening uh, to music on my headphones. I could hear the buoy out in the middle of the ocean, like, like a bell ringing. And I, I still go back there like weekly just to, this where my, where my place where I just get centered with the Lord. And I just, I remember crying out to him that night going, dude, what do you want me to do? Like, what do you want me to do? I've been given this gift of creativity and I feel paralyzed because I have so many options. Like, am I supposed to be like Wyland and paint, you know, you know, whales or be Kincaid and paint cottages? Like what's my niche? And through that process, the Lord just gave me this download of saying, I want you to take everything that's in your journal. And I want you to put that out to the world. And I'm like, dude, who's going to want to buy my underbelly of my life? Mm -hmm. Who's, who's going who's gonna to want to read? I mean, really, you want to hang that on your wall? Like, here's the worst part of somebody's life on a wall, right? Hmm. And so I kind of position, I, I positioned it kind of like this. I figured, you know, if this is a book or if this is a movie or if this was a film, what if these were images of that almost looked like it was taken out of an old church wall in Europe? And it was an, I, would, I was going to use the female figure, a, a woman, as an angel, as a mermaid, to be able to somewhat use these images to convey a story of my journal. So one was a woman with her arms stretched out, open to receive the priceless gift of serenity. Another mm -hmm. one was breakthrough. Another one was called exhale. Another one was called being fear driven. Another, you know, so all of these had this theme of overcoming and. Uh, and seeing how God wants to do something much greater with us. So I literally took my journey, my story, and brought that to life in these pieces. And that is the moment. This is the tipping point when faith became everything that I did, because here's why. I put those up, and at the time I was selling my artwork in the few of, few thousand dollar range, and I, I, I put these, I priced them at like 12 five each. And I put them in super world-class frames. They were incredible. I had two warehouses at the, one, at the time. I lived in one, and then I had another one that was show ready, super beautiful, awesome, ready to go, candles, lighting, the whole thing. This guy pulls up in this yellow Lamborghini, word of mouth, pulls up, and he walks in and he looks at that collection and he just goes, dude, I'm going to take those four right there. And I'm like, that's $48,000 a guy just dropped on buying my story. Hmm. the worst of me. Hmm. But here's what I learned in that moment in life. Our story is our greatest asset to help become a solution to help others in this world. Hmm. The good, the bad, the ugly. 
the stuff that we feel is broken, the stuff that we feel is ugly and the stuff that, that we want to have that, that, that we want to hide in shame. And we don't want to let anybody know that about us or our wounds. Man, that is the greatest asset that we actually have to be a solution to help others and provide them hope. And God, God wants to leverage and maximize our stories and what we've been through for his glory. It's almost like one of my mentors said this. He goes, Noah, you can't have glory without going through the crucible. You're, you're not going to taste like you finish a marathon and then you bite into that orange and then you drink that Gatorade. Does it, you can't describe that flavor of rejuvenation and hope than if you hadn't put in the mileage on that marathon and known what it takes to get there. You know what I'm saying? Like to savor that steak celebrating on an anniversary after you've gone through like a gnarly season in, in life with your marriage or with your kids or any of that kind of stuff. And you're just like, dude, this night is savored. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so my whole business and my whole life went into like being all in with the Lord was the moment that I realized my life and, and him putting me here on assignment is to be used as an echo back to him as an act of worship back. Mm. And it's summed up in one verse in Romans 12, one, where Paul says the message version I love more than anything. It says, therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in light of God's mercy to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your greatest act of worship. And it says, you know what? Don't be, don't be dragged down by culture and so easily entangled by culture, dragging you down to its level of immaturity. But God brings out the best in you and makes you a light on a hill to provide that hope. And so when I looked at that, I went, the greatest act of worship back to him for what he's done for me and rescuing me for myself it's to take my business, my faith, my family, my finances, and everything I've got and lay it onto him every single day as an act of worship and a sacrifice. Meaning, dude, if you want me to stop doing art today, I'm down. You can rearrange the furniture anytime you want. So that was the time frame. I was thir basically 30 years old. Wow. I have so many things to comment to this. Well, first of all, I mean, it's amazing that you had this realization that God spoke to you and had you look how you, you could serve your art to other people by sharing your story. And I, I think it's yeah. beautiful. I've seen this art piece and I commented about this, the one with the mermaid and the light yeah. shining on her. And I didn't know the meaning behind this. And I was, I mean, if you could touch on what the meaning of that one particular was, cause I actually want this, I think it's such a beautiful piece, but I would yeah. love to know the meaning so I could actually even more connect to it. Yeah. Yeah. So exhale was written out of a really hardcore crucible um, season that I was going through with life. And um, there was a couple things that were going on. One was massive betrayal. Ma one was massive betrayal. It, I had it from two, uh, two different family members. I had it from a couple different clients. Um, it was just straight up a crappy blind, just out of nowhere, rogue waves that were hitting life, hit, hit, hitting in life. And, whether you want to call it a depression or, or uh, a season of life where you just feel like you're being held down. I don't know how to, and you know what? It's a storm. And that's the best way to describe it. You know, it's going to pass, you know, it can't last forever, but you're just going like, okay, I'm holding on to the mass of this ship. As this storm blows through freaking waves are blowing up. Things are going crazy. Everything's in turmoil. Things are nuts. But in the midst, in the eye of this hurricane, I know I'm going to get through this, but I'm looking forward to that moment that I'm going to exhale. That's when I the glory. I love that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, I, I, and I know that that glory moment is going to hit where mm. I know that the, the, the cloud is going, to, is going to clear. The fog is going to clear. The clouds are going to pass. Things are going to clear up. But here's the thing. Most people break down, which is why I created another mermaid piece, which is actually called Breakthrough. And mm -hmm. so Exhale and Breakthrough and Purging My Soul is a part of the mermaid series on my site. And those pieces signify those seasons of life of like, how are we going to navigate those seasons? Are we going to be ones that retreat and break down? Or are we going to break through? Are we going to become better people as a result of the crucible? Or are we literally going to implode? And so the true nature of a person is revealed when they're being in the crucible. Their faith is going to be stretched. 
are you the type of person that just throws in the towel or, Hey dude, coach, call me out of the game, dude. Like this is just too gnarly. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I live by this saying, a wonderful saying, my one buddy said, he goes, Hey, when God starts to prune, lean into the knife. So I, most, I, people, most people don't want. Yeah. Don't and want. I've heard you talk to talk about living in uh, the, I'm trying to reword it, how you, or how you spoke it, but basically you want to be in the circumstances where God shows up. Oh, dude. <laughs> talk about that. Yeah. So like the, one of the best ways to describe it is this. When you live a life of faith, there's going to be two things that are evident if you're going to be in a life of faith. Like people say, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a believer and I'm a Christian and I'm following, you know, following Jesus and all that. I'm like, okay, here will be two things that are evident in your life. There will be massive risk and there will be massive danger. Mm. And people are going to be like, well, isn't God just a God of love and all that kind of like, yeah, he is. But as a result of his God and uh, being a God of love and the gift of grace that he's given me through his son is that beautiful gift of grace, which is nothing that I could do to earn it. I can't perform to earn his love. He freely gave it to me, no conditions. As an act of worship back, I'm just saying, dude, he loves me. I'm just going to step, I'm going to risk everything. And if I'm going to risk everything, that means I'm going to have to live a life on faith that requires him showing up in order for things to be able to happen. And so how does this become practical? If I, and I'm going to get kind of brutally practical, so I hope I don't <laughs> fluff anybody's feathers too much, but basically here's the deal. If I'm only giving money when I get money, there's no faith required. Yeah. If, I'm if I'm comfortable, there's no faith required. If I'm, if I'm only stepping when there's a sure thing, no faith required. If I'm only leaving that job the moment that I know that there's another one that's already set up, there's no faith required. A true life of faith means making decisions, acting and knowing things are going to show up because God is who he says he is, and he always does. But the reason why people don't think that God shows up is because this, or I could, say, I could say it better this way. The reasons why I believe people don't see the results with their relationship with God, because they're about building their own agenda. They're not bu about building his. God bless me. No, 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 dude, you're already blessed. Hmm. You're asking to be blessed. No, you're already blessed. You have everything that you need in Christ Jesus. Your business have you dedicated your business, your family, your marriage, your kids? Are you willing to sacrifice your kids on the altar back to God who gave them to you in the first place? Your kids are on loan to you. Your relationships are on loan to you. Your talents on loan to you. Are you stewarding those things wisely? Or are you just squandering them saying, I got a Willy Wonka ticket. I'm going to heaven. I can do whatever the flip I want. God's basically saying, um, based on the gift that I gave you, I'm inviting you into partnering with me, taking the franchise of my kingdom in your world and leveraging people to bring people to me through your irresistible lifestyle and, and incredible acts of service and your influence. You get to leverage all that to build my kingdom, but we get to do that together. But the reason why I think people fall short of that is because they're all about, if God loves me, he'll bless me. Right. To become more comfortable and to live more cush and to coast my way to death and you arrive at eternity bankrupt because you didn't do anything to invest in the kingdom. God's number one currency is people and souls, but yet we're investing in things that are going to flip and burn. Yeah. I've heard you talk about this, that that was one of, as well, I guess when you were 28, the turning yeah. point that you realized you were creating all this sex, uh, success, but it was all material things. And then talking about the subject going from success to significance, is that when the real pivot happened for you when you were 20? Yeah, that's exactly when it happened. Mm -hmm. And what I think is, was it really interesting is what happened, what started to happen was this. Um, we had a wonderful opportunity after I made that switch and went all in. Uh, Disney came into our world. Hmm. I didn't do anything like to go get it. It literally was a moment, uh, there was a meeting and then it was like, oh, we'd love to see excuse me, love to see your stuff. And then I showed some stuff and they're like, this is insane. Let's do this. Let's, let's just check out this experiment. We did it. It sold. Things went great. 
15 years later, it's still going. And there just came a moment, I went through my mentorship with the master's program and through my mentors, they just looked at me and they go, dude, success versus significance. You know, career is what you're paid to do. Your calling is what you're made to do. And when you look at, yeah, your career is an underwriter. Your career is a mechanism, a means to a way to an end, but your career is not your identity. And for me, so long, I introduced myself, talked at parties, was at dinners, and people would ask, so, so what do you do? And like, oh, I'm Noah the artist, and I'm an entrepreneur, and I have these businesses. And I, like, we switched that whole game up. Success and significance means you're leading with generosity of building God's kingdom first, and then you find ways to underwrite it. Mm. So for Chantel and I, we said, God's blessed us. We don't have all the money in the world that we would like and need in order to step into these initiatives. And kind of going back to your question of like, you wanted to live in a place of miracles and things like that. Basically for us to really go all in with God, with our business and our family and our lifestyle and everything that we are doing, it was going to require making decisions and initiatives that were building God's kingdom or being about his agenda. But we did not have the resources, the connections. We didn't have anything at our fingertips. Like example, so we made a decision to partner with Acres of Love in South Africa to, to rescue and care for AIDS orphans with special needs. Mm. That's what resonated with our heart. We were in the master's program. We're like, dude, our, heart, our world is getting turned upside down. How are we going to leverage our success in business and su success in having influence and speaking and books and all that? How are we going to leverage all of that as an ecosystem to underwrite something that will be waiting for us in eternity? Well, what's most important to God? Let's get in the Bible, get in his word and find out what resonates and makes his heart sing. And the three specific areas that makes God's heart come alive. One is the widow. Two is the orphan. In Psalms, it says he actually bends down over the balcony of heaven and picks the orphan off of the ash heap. So if I was at a party and I ran into God, I'd be like, so dude, what are you into? What's his calling card going to be? I have a heart for orphans, the defenseless, the fatherless. I have a heart for, for widows. And I have a heart for people. I'd be like, okay, dude, I want to be on that agenda. Mm -hmm. So when Chantel and I made a decision of who, who we're going to partner with and how we're going to partner with them, we want to find, find people that were doing this in a world-class way. And that is Acres of Love. We went down and we started investigating. We didn't have the money. But I just went down there immediately and said, if I have partnered with heaven, and if I am a child of God, a co-heir of Christ, an ambassador where he's making his appeal through our marriage and through our family, I have billions of dollars at my fingertips. But everybody that's a believer is walking around broke in their mind mm. with a lack of, I'm like, excuse me? If you were part of the royal family in England, are you tripping on where you're, how you're going to pay your next mortgage bill? It's not even on your flipping radar. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. It's Matthew 6. Or Matthew, uh, 6. We don't need to be worrying. We don't need to be tripping out about this. But when he puts us on assignment, he's not going to send you on assignment without the resources and all the, the, uh, the things that are needed to back that up in that assignment, that journey. If he's going to put you on Mount Everest to go to the top, he's, not, he's going to send you a guide, send you the equipment, send you the resources, send you the map. He's not going to leave you hanging. So Chantel and I went down and started turning over stones. We already acted like we had all the money in the world. <clears throat> and we said this, we go, all right, what does it take to underwrite a house in South Africa? We don't know the first thing about it. What do we need to do about it? Oh, it's like $270,000 a year to be able to underwrite a home. Okay, wait, wait. So 270 to acquire it, what does it cost to underwrite it per year? And they go 90 grand per year. All right, how many homes do you guys have? 30 homes. I'm like, okay. I looked at Chantel, I'm like, dude, we have some, but we don't have all. But God showed us that when it comes to an assignment, you are not the entire solution. You are a part of the solution. Mm, I love that. So we could use our, um, our influence and our connections and our friends. I have just, this is amazing what God has done with the story. So we just, we just said, yes. All right, Lord, we need 90 K a year. We need 270 just to get the home. There's 3.5 million kids in South Africa that are orphaned. 3.5 million children. There are moms dying on the side of the road that can't care for the child. So she's dying the baby's dying in her arms. There is a massive problem. 80% of the world's wealth is inside the United States. 
80% of the world's need is outside of the United States. You wanna know how much money actually leaves the United States? 20%. 20% actually leaves the United States to be deployed out to the rest of the world. So I said, you know what, forget those stats. What can we do as a small little family here in Southern California? We're gonna say yes to this assignment that we, have n we don't have the resources for. We don't, we're not experts at this, but we're gonna step into territory. This is what I'm getting at. We wanted to live in this space where miracles were required to happen on a daily basis. Wow. We wanted to see the evidence of God firsthand every day. How do you do that? You got to step into a life of faith that is so ridiculous that it requires God to show up to fill in the blanks. Hmm. Next, the next thing that happened within two days, we had a phone call from a couple that said, hey, we heard about what you're doing. We want to take you to dinner. They basically said, we're going to partner with you guys and we're going to come up with half of it. I'm like, excuse me? We just sat there, didn't even know what to say. The next, next following week, we heard from a car dealership in Southern California that said, hey, we're underwriting the house for the 270. Wait, what? Then it was like, okay, and just here's another beautiful thing. Just yesterday, and I'm, I'm, you know, whenever you listen to this podcast, like yeah. literally yesterday, I got confirmation from Newman's own foundation, the food company that you see in all the grocery stores. They just partnered with us for a grant. They approached me while I was in an event and just walked up and said, Hey, we'd love to be able to bless what you guys got going on with your mission and all that. I'm like, it's not our mission. It's God's mission. We're just being the flipping guy with the megaphone out front going, Hey, we need help. Right? right. Do you see what I'm getting at here? When you wake up every single day, and miracles must happen in order for things to happen. It's a beautiful space because it's not on our effort and God gets all the glory. But now business looks, business isn't a business. Business is a mission. When you get up and your company is about fulfilling a greater mission and not just becoming more comfortable, everything we do on a daily basis will be investing in, king, in the kingdom. And the Lord says this, he goes, do whatever you defer and do in my name while you're on earth. I'm going to multiply that 30, 60, 100x. Every $1,000, how would you like to multiply that 100x? And it'll be waiting for you in eternity. His word is that real. And I'm like, wait a minute. Everybody's trying to become a baller and a billionaire here on this earth. Where do you need it most? You want to be a baller in eternity working side by side with your heavenly father because there is rank. There is, um, there is seniority. There is work and there is currency. What you do down here with your time, talent, and treasure and how you invest it will be measured. You will show up broke or you will show up rich. And so all I want to do is spend my life, honestly, like the art thing's been cool. The mentoring is cool. The coaching is cool. These courses are cool. But dude, if it was all in vain and doesn't steer people to a life of significance, I've wasted my time. Mm. I love all that you said. Oh my goodness. But the biggest thing is there's so many people in fear. And I know you talk about fear and shame so much. You wrote a book about it, Fear Hunters. Yeah. So for all those people that are so fearful to step into the unknown and the risky, how... How can we start to, I mean, I mean, you've developed this foundation, you have a strong, uh, you have a strong faith and everything, but for people that are fearful of the unknown, how could we really start to strip that down and, and allow things to take place as God intends it to be? Yeah. Well, the good news is, um, <laughs> right now, 8 AM every morning, I'm walking people through fear hunters. So if you want to watch the replays on Facebook or, or YouTube, Noah fine art, you can watch the replays there through each chapter. And so overcoming the fear of the unknown, um, the, the, here's, here's why I don't trip. Because God knows. God knows. I don't need to know, but he knows. And if I'm backed by heaven and if I've partnered with him, the creator of this universe that put me on assignment, he's not, he's not going to play a trick on me. Will crappy stuff happen? Totally. I mean, but this is the equivalent of like, if, if all of us, each one of us is a brand, right? And if all of us are a brand, like a cruise ship, and we're in port, that's the equivalent of like saying, God's made me into this brand and I'm this cruise ship, but I'm only going to stay in the harbor and I'm never going to go out to sea because I don't know if the weather's going to come up and if there's going to be a rogue wave. I'm like, wait a minute. You don't get to go to the destinations. 
and you don't get to see the world and go on the grand adventure, it's playing it safe, it's playing it safe, sitting in port. You know what I'm saying? It's like, um, dude, it requires faith and understanding like our heavenly father's got us. Um, and I got to find my one book. I don't know if I have it right here, but there's a quote. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. But the quote yeah. is basically this. One of my buddies, we're writing a script on um, my new uh, movie that we're doing. But basically this, it's this. When you're no longer afraid of death, you've taken away your enemy's greatest weapon. Are you really cool with dying? Because if you are, nothing can phase you. Fear of the unknown? Oh, that's training wheels now. That's gone. Anxiety? Not a fruit of the spirit. Worry? Not a fruit of the spirit. Why? You're partnered with heaven. You're not afraid of dying. You're willing to completely lay down everything for his cause. Are you really that in? Or you're in conditionally because you want to see the Lord show up in your life. It's when you are 100% available to be used as a vessel to reconcile people to him through you. Hmm. And so you're willing to die for that. And you know what? If the coronavirus or a rogue wave or a car wreck or some other freak of nature, a guy just got eaten by a shark in Santa Cruz last weekend. Like forget the coronavirus. You have no idea when you're going to go. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's and everybody's right. so gun shy and tiptoeing around. That ain't living, dude. That's maintenance. That's a fear-based life and perfect love casts out all fear. You want to have fear out of your life? Completely have your life filled with Christ. That's simple. I know it sounds simple, but dude, that is it for me. And that's why you can live fearlessly. I love it. Uh, well, I think a lot of the reason why people are afraid of dying is because they haven't lived out their calling, their purpose, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't yeah. stepped into their purpose, so they feel unfulfilled. And I think yeah. as you talk about a lot is you discovered your calling, you discovered your significance that you wanted to live. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's the hardest thing for us all to get to is, is what is our purpose? What is our calling and how, to, how do we determine that? So what is your message on that? Yeah, no. So the, here's, here's the great news today. I'm going to make, hopefully for a lot of folks, <laughs> for the first time, maybe life and the meaning of life is going to snap into view for the first time ever with what I'm about to say. And I believe that this will literally launch them into not just freedom, but clarity and balance and focus. And maybe they haven't had that in years. Clarity to see things as they truly are. Focus to focus on that which is going to produce results and balance to be able to just go, finally, it doesn't feel frantic. And here's what it is. Let me be super clear with you. People Listen. are saying, <laughs> what's that? I'm listening. I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> full ears. <laughs> People are saying, man, what is, what is the purpose of my life? Um, what is the calling that's on my life? And how am I supposed to live, live that out? And I walked around with that question for so long and it came, it finally was revealed to me when I realized, and it was unpacked through my mentorship, that when you look at God, God had everything. He did. He had the universe. He had the earth. He had everything. And, and Tim Keller does a wonderful job of articulating this, but he just goes, dude, he had everything. But the one thing he didn't have is he didn't have us. And there's a, there's, a, there's a verse in Matthew that says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, where was God's heart? Us. What was his greatest treasure? His son. What did he do with his greatest treasure? He whipped out a pen and with the blood of his son, opened his checkbook and wrote a check to purchase you so that you could have freedom in him and eternity. So that says to me that God is the most generous when he didn't need to be. God was the most generous when I didn't deserve for that to be done to me. I certainly don't deserve it. I deserve death because I'm sinful. That's just the way that I'm wired. My free will and choice just says, go do everything bad. But because of his love for me, he humbled himself through his generosity, gave his number one prized possession, 
his son so that we could have eternal. He came down to meet us on our level and on our means. What is my response back for that? Well, let me just tell you, when it comes to my purpose and the meaning of life, I have to look at what Jesus did. What was his purpose? To love God, to love people, and to make disciples. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. So if I'm truly a follower of Jesus, my purpose basically is his purpose. To love God, to love people, to make disciples. Now, most just love God and love the part of loving people. Right? They just say, I'm a believer, and man, I'm such a good person. I'm such a great person. I'm spiggity clean, man. Look at how great I'm. I've got a chrome-plated life, and it's the hamster wheel where I am holy, I know all of the biblical truth, I know all of the scripture, I love God, but I bear no fruit. Jesus forewarned us and said, hey, when it comes to your purpose and your true meaning of your life, you're going to love God, you're going to love people, but how am I going to know that? How am I going to be able to measure a life well lived, making disciples, bringing people to him? How many people, and I tell this to people all the time, I'm like, all right, you're coming in here to get mentorship and get coaching? Great. Welcome to my gym. So how do we measure ourselves at the gym? Get on that freaking scale. Show me how many reps that you can do. That's the fruit of your labor, correct? Mm. Nobody's doing that in a spiritual sense. So what's the easiest way for us to step on the scale when it comes to understanding how much fruit are we bearing? I ask the simple questions. How many people have come to know who Jesus Christ is in your life as a result of this last week, last month, last quarter? 2019, how many people are in eternity as a result of all the busyness that you did? And they go, there isn't any. And I go, you are alive with no fruit. Hmm. Watch this. This is where it's brutal. Barna Research says these are people that are holy. We got 50% of everybody that actually becomes a Christian that actually goes to church. And of those, of those people that go to church, only 1% become in the pursuit of holiness. That means that there are a ton that take a detour of, I know the Bible back and front, have read every self-help book that's, whole, that's spiritually based. And you know what? I'm a good person, but I'm a Pharisee. Hmm. I'm a know-it-all, but I'm bearing no fruit. Gosh, you guys, I was one for a very long time. The net ROI, listen, if God is our investor and he put us here on earth on assignment, what sort of return on investment is he getting from our life? Am I really taking the first fruits from the money that I earn, regardless of if we can pay our bills or not, regardless of circumstances, am I still taking 10 off the top as training wheels just to get my generosity going of work as an act of worship back for what he's done for me? Or am I only going to give when I've got it? Oh, one day when I finally get bills paid, then I'll give. You know what? You know what? You want to see God show up? Give him first, then let him fill in the blanks. Who do you want it on? You or on him? Put it on him. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So here's the purpose in life. Love God. Love people. Make disciples. Now, the how you do that, that's what makes you, you. Mm, I love that. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. We all have the same purpose. We all have the same, watch, not just a calling, who is our caller? People go, yeah, I want to know my calling. I walk up to him and I go, great, who's, who's your caller? Mm. If our caller is God, which it is, and if our purpose is his, which it is, we are about taking our unique, irresistible lifestyle, acts of service, and our influence because at the end of the life, you're going to stand before him and he's going to go, what did you do with my son and what I put in front of you? And you're going to go, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And he's going to go, awesome. Let's turn our, let's look over our shoulder right now. And how many people are here as a result of your life? Because God's currency and his currency is not money. It is people. But if you use your earthly wealth to store up for yourself treasures in heaven, things that will last forever, that is people. That is the only thing that will not burn at the end of your life as a person's soul. So I get out of bed and I go, I can spend today, waste today, invest today. And the gospel of the kingdom in full force in my business and faith and family and finances and fitness all runs through that filter. 
So hopefully that helps with the meaning of life. <laughs> That's so great. So great. Yeah, actually, you talk about this. I know how, how you invest wisely. And, and I know you talk about time management, uh, mm -hmm. mastering your life, and especially in the time you spend. Yes. Um, and I know some of the, thing, the great things you do, I've heard you talk about, is your once a week uh, or your commitment to your wife for the, I don't know how long you've been married, but every week yeah. you have a date night. That's your yep. commitment. That's your time that you're yes. devoting to your marriage. And I think it's beautiful. Um, yeah. But also touching on that, I know um, planting seeds. So I believe that is one of the ways of significance is planting seeds on others. And yes. you know how are you going to help lead somebody into um, being of service as, as themselves as well in, in their own purpose or calling? So is that partly why you developed your courses, NOAA University, the master program? And was that to take your knowledge and to serve it onto others so they could then live their life in their yeah. own personal calling? Yeah. So a great question. So one of the best things that you can do with the seed, the seed that you've been given, like if God gives you a bag of seed in that, in that bag of seed in your life is your time, is your talent. All right. And is your money. All right. And, and in addition to that, there's others like relationships, but the three big one is your time and your talent and your money. And you're going to have to strategically figure out. And what I mentor and coach and help people do is invest that as wisely as possible. And here's an example. I've got coaches. I have uh, leaders, influencers in my life that I help coach that they don't realize how many assets they're actually sitting on things that mm -hmm. can go to work for them while they're sleeping. Um, initiatives they can start and launch to then generate additional income to use to underwrite more kingdom initiatives. Right? So I, I look at it as like, I use this analogy of like a farmer. You have a brand new plot of land and on that plot of land, you can plant whatever you want. Okay. And this is an example of stewardship. Most people want to see something right away. That's just the way we're wired. So they plant perennials, but they come up and they die quickly. They come up and they die quickly. Other people want to be like, no, let's have something that sticks around for a while and looks great. They're going to put shrubs so they build shrubs and bushes. Man, they've grown, they stay. We're looking at something. We're looking at tangible stuff. But this is what's interesting. Those two first things that you're planting, and that could be business, that could be whatever you're doing in life that you think is gonna generate impact and income. Income is one thing, impact is another. Now watch this, you planted perennials, great. Well, bushes are lasting a little bit longer. But the problem with bushes and the problem with perennials, you can't eat them. They don't yield anything other than look. It's like fast food. It just looks great, but it doesn't sustain any value. Really what you want to be in the business of is planting something that's going to yield fruit over time. And one is if you can eat it. Two is if it can yield year after year after year after year. Actually, what I want to help individuals and leaders do is plant flipping vineyards. Yielding a fruit, even when they're not even present. And if we're smart and we do this correctly based on biblical um, backing through what Jesus says, you're actually going to help people plant their own wineries where your fruit is growing on other people's trees. Hmm. So your seed and the way that you actually plant that seed, you need to be strategic with it. So I ask myself, if I'm going to go start a new course, will I see the results of this waiting for me in eternity? I know that sounds like an, I got to begin everything I do with the end in mind. Otherwise, I'm a fool. And Proverbs explicitly talks about the wise person and the foolish person. The fool thinks here and now. The wise thinks now and forever. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So when people come in, hey, I want to start this course. I go, why? Well, because I want to be able to do this and I just want to teach my own's like, okay, yeah, but why? Like we, like, I just like grill them and grill them and poke the bear and poke the bear. And then, but by the end of this, we massage their entire life into helping them get clear of focus that holy mackerel, dude, if I invest in building these courses and building these online initiatives and writing these books and going out on stage and and doing lead magnets and doing um, uh, masterminds and doing meetups and virtual meetups and coaching. All wow, I came in here with one idea to do business. 
I'm walking out of here with a dozen that work holistically together in an ecosystem, all complementary, and it can go to work for me bearing fruit. Listen, I don't want to make you a billionaire just so you can be more comfortable. I want to help you become significant so you can bear as much fruit as possible. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, it's so beautiful. I love it. I, I love what you, your vision and what you create or bring out of people to see the vision in themselves and what their bigger purpose to serve. Yeah. Uh, it's so beautiful. And uh, do you believe that collaboration is a way to uh, leverage significance? Totally. Do you, you do. And yeah. why is that? Because we're doing it right now. You and I are doing this right now in collaboration. Mm -hmm. People in your camp will see this and it will bear fruit. People in my camp will see this and it will bear fruit. And this is the way that we lock arms together as believers on a global scale and ra a rising tide raises all ships. So the enemy wants to do everything possible to keep believers from working and networking and, and collaborating together. Because when believers come together, fireworks go off. More market share is taken. And you need to understand the battle that we're fighting and where we're fighting it. Right now, we are on enemy soil. No matter where you go on earth, you're still on the enemy's territory. I don't care how nice it looks. I don't care if you're on like Lake Como right now. Right now, you're on the enemy's territory behind enemy lines if you're a believer. And if you're doing anything that is going to take market share from, from him, you are going to be met with massive opposition. If I can lock arms with other believers, if I can lock arms with other believers and help raise the tide for the kingdom, and, and, and heaven is backing me on that with legions and legions of angels and hosts and the backing, the Holy Spirit and my heavenly father and Christ at my side. Um, and if we're all doing that together, this is going to be a pretty amazing offense. Uh, yeah. You see oh, what I'm I saying? It. Yeah. So I, I, I look at, I'm always looking for collaboration. I'm always looking and I want to, I want to tear down those walls of the silos as fast as possible, dude. Nothing drives me more crazy than people just trying to, Oh no, I got to keep everything close chested. You know, this is my IP. This is my program or this is my course. And I don't want like, I don't want to co-mingle our tribes. What are you talking about? That's not your tribe. This is our family father's tribe. Hmm. And there's plenty to go around. Yeah. And for example, your programs that you share, it's your knowledge that you've built. So, I mean, how selfish would it be if you are not sharing that to help others? Because it's not dude. like they're going to steal your art, oh. you know? <laughs> dude, I beg people, take it, please exploit the heck out of it. <laughs> That's know? awesome. Yeah. It's like, dude, it's going to do nothing but help people, hopefully. Yeah. And I've heard you say this quote. I loved it. Uh, I wrote this down when we were talking about this or what you said in the Rise Challenge that you should fit your life around your work, not your work around your life. So can you go into explaining that? Because I think that's one way of uh, really uh, being happy in our purpose or in our calling is yeah. enjoying it. Yeah, well, totally. You got, I mean, the, the journey is meant to be enjoyed. And, and when you think about this, Sabbath is a, a big part of our father's way of operating in business. Um, he, you know, he goes hard. He loves work. Work was is is a big part of it, and again, glory tastes really, really good, man. When you've when you've earned it and when you've worked for it, it's just really, really healthy. And so, when he Sabbath, he looked at his work and he said, "This is good. This is really good," and he's going to rest from that. And the interesting thing about that is is it's a it's a big time indicator to remind us that our rest right now, like I did a transformation over the last year and a half with my physical body. And the success of that was contingent upon my rest. Hmm. Not just how I worked out, not how I ate, how I rested. Hmm. Now, what if you became a professional rester in a physical transformation? Like you literally, you, instead of feeling guilty about sleep, like I'm not talking about being a sloth and like sleeping in forever. I'm talking about, oh, I'm going to be strategic about what I eat before I go to bed so that I can actually go to sleep earlier, wake up earlier, have more alone time with God, get strategies. And like the domino effect of that thing's insane. What if you actually took that same exact approach when it came to Sabbath and you're approaching your mind out of operating out of rest in your business? Hmm. You, Nobody can, thinks of it that way. <laughs> can you truly turn it off 
and operate. Shea Bynes has done a wonderful job of articulating in her book, Grace Over Grind. And the, the one quote, if I could take one quote out of that entire book, Shea does a wonderful job of saying this. Whatever you self-promote and sign yourself up for will require you to self-sustain. Whatever God invites you into via his grace, he will supply the grace to sustain you. It will not be your own strength. Mm. You'll be working in your calling and your calling is so sweet and so smooth and the yoke is easy and the burden is light because why? Your heavenly father teed up that opportunity for you to go big and it's going to require very little effort. It's like when Tiger Woods is in his prime, it's effortless power. You see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. Sabbath and rest of fitting your work around or fitting your work around your life, not your life around your work says, I am going to allow work to come into my life. Work is a means to an end. It's not an identity. Career is just something that underwrites the bigger initiatives, but it's not what I, it's not who I am. Work is what I do. It's not who I am. Now you want to see things get really interesting for a person? Go drop them off in the middle of a flipping desert or a country that's not their own, and there's no enterprise around them to support them of what they do for a living, and they are just a freaking person. The bigger question is, what value do they add right there in who they are without anything around them to define them? No podcasts, no platforms, no business, no name on the wall, no credibility, no social media, nobody to define who they are. Who are they really, and what do they have to offer? Because that is your true value. And if you're standing there and you're feeling completely empty in that flipping desert or that unknown territory, I wanted to be able to be dropped anywhere on earth and then immediately I can create value. And I want to help other people be able to have and live with that confidence. That's not a, that's not a cockiness. That's a righteous confidence of who they are called to be in Christ. So why do I, I used to for a lot of years, found my identity in business found my, my identity and everything that I did for a living. So therefore, what I did for a living was everything that I did. Family got the crumbs. Family got the second. Family got the kick the dog syndrome with business was sucking and business didn't, wasn't making as much money as I wanted. I was pissed off at the world and my family was the one that had to deal with the fallout. Well, what if I flipped it around and said, I wonder why my business isn't being blessed because I'm because I got my priorities screwed up and God's basically saying until you know how to govern the business that's underneath the roof of your house with your spouse and your children you have zero business going out and trying to change the world. That freaking leveled me. Yeah, wow. You have zero business going out and trying to change the world, start a business, make an impact and take over the world when you can't even govern the ministry that's underneath your house with your spouse and children. Mm. In terms of the priority list, where do you think God sees them? Right, right. Crumb, crumbs or immediately after him? So for me, it goes God. It goes Chantel's heart, my wife. It goes Noah and Griffin, my kids right after that. And right after that, it goes others. And right after that, it goes the culture. It goes the bigger sea as a whole. Oh, and way down at the bottom at the end is me. Will I set dates for myself to do retreats? Totally. Will I journal? Yes. But when you're about your father's business, and if you're about that focus, all the other stuff gets taken care of. Matthew 6, says, seek first my kingdom and righteousness, and I'll add everything else to you. Mm -hmm. People really don't believe that if they trust God with everything in their life, including their clients and business and finances and all of that, they think all hell's going to break loose and the wheels are going to come off if they truly trust God. I'm going to lose my job. I might lose, he might ask me to go somewhere I don't want to go. Give me a freaking break. He's your dad. He knows exactly what you love. And more. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I, I work for me now. I fit it around my life. I don't, I don't adjust my life to accommodate my work. My calendar, my time, all of it my terms based on what's going to allow me to stay in the lane of where I produce the most fruit. That takes a ton of discipline. That's why I teach it now because right. people have to put serious boundaries and parameters to guard that precious seed time. 
I love that. And I don't think a lot of people look at it in that way. And, and that's a game changer and you setting your priorities. And like you said, to, I, I do believe in filling our cup and the self care we give to ourselves and everything, but we also need to sustain our relationships and our, you know, family life and everything like that. So I would love if you could share some of the tips of how you nurture that first and foremost. So for the family? Yeah. Yeah. So on a practical level, we do date night. We do date night um, every week. And we've been doing that for a very long time. Like last night, we just had it here and converted my studio and place settings and wine and great music and food and just relax and look out over the backyard and um, unpack like what's going on with the family. Chantel's we're going through a bunch of stuff with her dad right now and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know, stuff with the kids and stuff with business. And so it's our time, you know, when you're running a bed and breakfast and you're running and raising kids, like a lot goes down every seven, seven days. And if you're not taking inventory on that, it's no wonder marriages are falling apart and people, because they're not asking the questions during date night, dude, what do you need right now? And how can I help? Chantel and I have that, that question on a daily basis. We have to ask each other, what's on your radar? What do you need today? Like, you got to ask your spouse that question. And there are days where I'm like saying, dude, I appreciate you asking. And just the fact that you're asking really puts wind in my sail. Actually, I'm good. And then there's other days where I'm like, dude, if you're able to go to that hardware store, grab that paint, then drop this off over at the bank. And then you're going, if you can go to Costco and pick up the food that I need, that's going to put, that's going to take a massive amount of stress off my day to day. You see what I'm saying? I love so that. It's like, dude, you're on a team and nobody's talking. Nobody's getting in a huddle. And so, so that's on the marriage front. So take an inventory. And by the way, when you're doing dream, uh, when you're doing uh, date night and you're asking, take an inventory, you know, find out what the dreams are. Because love languages shift um, every single season. Um, and you want to find out what's on people's radars in terms of like, hey, what's on your radar, babe, with where you want to go, what you want to do, where are some of the things you want to accomplish? For the most part, like when we've been working on it 20 years, in the first 10 years, it's like, you know, there's a lot of things we need to adjust. Second 10 years, like, we're there. We have everything that we need. We're more than content. There's nothing that we need right now. I'm like, great. I'm going to continue asking that question. And if there's something that comes up, I want to be the first one to hear about it. Lastly, with kids, we do best days. And best days are days where they get to do whatever they want to do for an entire day from morning when they wake up to when they go to bed. No screens, no movies. But we're going to go anywhere that they want to go in the world, do whatever they want to do, eat whatever they want to eat. And it's making and underwriting their dreams because you're not going to have your kids forever. You know, I look at it like this. Griffin's going to be 18 in, in two years. That's 18 summers. So soon. <laughs> yeah. That's 18 summers. That's 18 Christmases. Right now, she's going to be 17. I've got two left, two summers, two Christmases. But even when they're of age, I'm not stopping best days. And that could be per quarter. That could be a couple times a year. But debt, best days are the days that they will write in the books. Mm. This, is the, this is what goes on the wall of fame. I, I can tell you right now, if you went to the kids and said, hey, what are the best days that you remember that you did with your dad? They can list them to you. Whether we went to the plaza, flew first class, stayed at the plaza in New York, and Noah wanted to do the home alone trip. He did. He wanted to reenact the home alone trip. We did it. <laughs> My daughter's like, dude, I want to go stay in a suite in Vegas and go see Michael Jackson and eat ice cream and just hang out. We did it. Make your family's dreams come alive because you know what? All work and no play makes for a dull, dull life. And I'm not talking about just being a baller all the time and going great places. I'm talking about individually taking your children and investing into them personally, one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one. And then you're doing date night because the kids need to see that you're doing date night. Mm -hmm. But lastly, what's so beautiful about this is, as a leader in your home is that when you're being intentional with your marriage, if you're being intentional with your children, that is the evidence of God's heart through you as a leader in your home. Amen. I love it. I People love it. can tangibly see and touch and feel what it's like to experience God through you as a leader in your home. Mm, I love that. My boyfriend and I started, we haven't, uh, we were supposed to do it every two weeks that we call it the summit and we go over five areas in a relationship that kind of similar is you. It's like, what, what are you, how are you feeling right now? What, what's your big goals? Uh, talk about finance. And, and we would be there. It's that time to be vulnerable with your partner and creating that space 
and time to do that because when everyday life you don't get to talk about those things yeah. so i i think it's beautiful and i think it's a great thing to share um best days as well like those yeah. are the memories that you hold yep. on to so yep. and i've heard you talk about how uh how you don't make a god a silent partner in your life and yeah. i've heard people talk about like god is the ceo of my life as well so can you go into like what what does that mean to you yeah, so God, God is my God is my CEO, but pri primarily uh, God is the investor in my life. If He put me here on inside on assignment, if He's backed me, which He has, as a child of God, He's backed me. I'm in the family business of working and partnering with Heaven with Him. So I, if I if He's made if I'm an ambassador of Christ and He's making His appeal through me, imagine if I went into business with Subway or Young Living Oils or whoever. I'm an ambassador of the brand. I represent the brand that I am going out there and selling. What's the return on investment if he's backing and underwriting my life? So many people are like, I want God to bless me and bless me with more business. Like, listen, God doesn't bless our, 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 doesn't bless our finances to increase our standard of giving, but to increase our standard of giving. That's Randy Alcorn. We want to be blessed, but just to be blessed. We're blessed as a child of God, but yet we, would, we don't want to pay it back or invest in the family business of where it came from. And then the Lord's like, dude, I think it's amazing how you young entrepreneurs want to go get a franchise with Subway and pay your license fee of whatever it is, five to 15% and live by the brand Bible of Subway. That's just a case, case in point of a franchise model. But yet our heavenly father gives us his word, the Bible says you can do whatever you want with it for free. And if it's cool, would you be willing to give me back 10%? Not required. But the reason why 10% is, is, is in there, because it's training wheels. Mm. What if everything was in? What if you just took what's needed to underwrite your life and the rest went to the kingdom? What if you reverse tithe? There's a lot of believers that live that aggressively that want to live with miracles because they want to invest in the kingdom where they need it most. They will arrive in eternity rich ballers where they need it most, which is forever. And they're willing to defer gratification here to gain upside there. Are you willing to live at mom's house? Are you willing to live in an apartment? Are you willing to downside? Oh no, everybody thinks that I'm unsuccessful. Bull crap. God's your investor. I want, to, I want to be a smart investor. I want to live as nimble and small and, and leverage everything that we can because that gives us more bandwidth to give and make an impact. Literally. Mm -hmm. The quote, um, John, uh, what was it? John Maxwell, he said, like to live a life of significance is be on the service or be in the service of others. Mm -hmm. And it, providing, if you have success, it's about providing the ladder and that's the significance is holding the ladder for somebody. And so... And also, I, I think it was uh, Les Brown. He said, "You learn, you earn, and then you pass it on." Mm -hmm. but so dude, it's all question, about being in service. Like, of yeah, others. and the question is, is like, how much do you flip and really need? And by the way, if you have extra seed and you put it in the barn, and everybody just wants to put seed away so they can feel better and more secure, it rots. Money has no power sitting. Hmm. Money has zero power sitting. Money cannot grow sitting. Most believers are sitting alongside of a river and up at the top is a reservoir. And the moment God fills up that reservoir and the power of that amount of power of uh, revenue and money flowing down that stream, what, they, what do they want to do? Believers want to go build a dam because they don't trust that God's going to make it rain again. They don't really believe that if they put all of their seed into the ground and leverage all their assets, that God will make it rain again. You see, you really, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah. they don't trust. They, don't, they really don't trust. And in your book, Fear Hundreds, do you talk about breaking down that barrier of fear? Totally. And yeah. because what's if you the, don't... What's the upside of it? What's on the other right. side? The most reason why people don't overcome fear is they don't know what's the upside on the other side. Mm -hmm. Great. Now that I'm free, now what am I supposed to do with my life? Part three of the entire book is stepping into your unique kingdom calling. And your dude... You want to be fearless. Why? Because you want to bear as much fruit as you possibly can. You can't do that sucking your thumb sitting in a corner. Right. Right. 
and stuffing you know and yeah. Like growing up, you go from infancy to adolescence to maturity in your business. You go from infancy to adolescence to maturity in your faith. Most of us are going to be grown ups in life, but an infant in our faith because we're sucking on the bottle and the pacifier of playing to our wounds, our hurts, and we can never get in the game and God can never use a person like me. Bull. God used extraordinary individuals in the Bible that did not have a pedigree in their career that matched anywhere near their kingdom impact. Mm, so good. So good. If you, if you were to share like one piece of advice of how we could live in significance and step beyond success. Cause a lot of people don't talk about significance. It's, it's, everybody talks about yeah. success. Like, yeah. you know, you go, sur- I think you said survival success and then significance are the three tiers of life. Yeah. Yeah. So since it's not talked about so much, what is your biggest piece of advice to um, step into, step past success and lead a life of significance? Don't aim at success. Mm-hmm. Just, just say today, I'm a professional giver. Why? Because of what God's done for me. And I want to increase, I want to write, I want to write checks that Jesus would write checks for. Do, does it have his name on it? Does this initiative, this charity, everything that I'm doing advance the gospel of the kingdom? I do not want to make people more comfortable on the way to hell. And there's a lot of people doing good things, but they're not God things. Right. And that's brutal talk. But I got to look at where I'm going to invest my seed, my time, my talent, and treasure wisely. I'm going to do those things that Jesus would write a check for that will be waiting in eternity. What are those things that matter most to him? Souls. Is the charity that I'm partnering with not only doing a good thing, but also giving the gospel with it? It's one thing to feed a stomach. It's another thing to feed a heart that gives you eternal life. Hmm. What am I going to do? I'm going to go find feeding the homeless or feeding hunger, solving that problem while at the same time providing eternal life. I'm not just looking at making people more comfortable. I want to give a life. I want to give water that never runs out. I want to take the message of our heavenly father and say, I'm just going to focus on being leading a life in generosity and focus on solving those solutions. And you know what? Success will happen. Success is no longer my aim. Survival, getting bills paid. No, I'm just going to be about my father's agenda today. I'll let him worry about the bills. Seek first his kingdom and righteousness, and he'll take care of everything else. He, that's, he said it. I didn't say it. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you can't go wrong there. That's awesome. <laughs> I love so that, it. There, that's, that's my one bit of advice. That's so great. Well, how could everybody learn about your programs? Because you, I, I don't even know how many programs you have, but I know you yeah. have NOAA University. Yeah. Um, so I'd love people to check this out. So where yeah. could it best? So if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can go to noahelias.net. But you, uh, if you go to noahelias.net, that'll have everything there. Now, I do have a couple webinars and trainings that you can check out. You can go to masters.life. You can go to masters.life forward slash success. You can go to uh, noahuniversity.com forward slash impact. But if you go to noahelias.net, you're going to see everything there. Even the coaching, you'll see our mission with Acres of Love. You'll see all of our books. You'll see everything that we've got going on. Amazing. And even by your artwork, right? That's right. So amazing. Yeah, I I love everything. I mean, I was so intrigued. I I was just scrolling through. I'm like, so many programs. It's like, how do you even pick? But does Noah University provide... I think I saw something that you could get all of it in a batch. Like yeah, a bundle, so right? you can get every single one of my courses. You can get every single one of my courses for free if you do the coaching with me. Amazing. Yeah, oh my that's gosh. normal. That like all the courses are like worth 18K, but you get them all for free if you do the coaching with me. Awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to be coached by you? Jeez, like pushing, pushing us forward in life and just leading a well, life. I, I want to help you become significant and bear Amazing. as much freight as you possibly can. I can't think of anything funner to do. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Noah. I appreciate your time so much and knowledge. And I mean, you just like light my heart on fire. Just like, I mean, it, it really, it w- awakens me to awesome. say the least. Yeah. So awesome. thank you so much. This You're welcome. Has been so awesome. Yeah. <laughs>